I've been really enjoying this wonderful special year and uh, I'm very um, happy to be invited to give a talk. Um, can we see that? Let's see. Is the top? Is that better? That good? All right. So <laughs> I'm eventually going to be talking about joint work with Natalie Wall on string topology. But uh, given the audience here, and uh, um, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about uh, the geometric motivation and the relationship between these uh, loop products and geodesics. So um, we start, I start off uh, with geometry. So uh, I have a compact Riemannian manifold, dimension n. And if you start, I, I, this audience all knows that if you start at a given point with a given velocity vector, um, that there's a unique geodesic. And you can follow that uh, on and on if the manifold is complete. And uh, so the, the question then is, will it ever come back exactly to this point pointing in exactly that direction? And I don't know, it doesn't really seem that likely, but maybe, right? So this is the search for closed geodesics on a compact Riemannian manifold. And it goes back to Poincaré and Birkhoff and Morse and many, many, many other people. Um, so here are some things. That, that we know. OK, so I'm going to assume that the fundamental group is, is trivial, just because it's, it's a huge subject already. And uh, that's what I've worked in. And so these are some things that, that are known. Uh, Gromel and Meyer and Sullivan and Begay Poirier proved t together that uh, for most manifolds, Every metric has infinitely many closed geodesics. So that's a nice answer. Uh, um, the condition that you need for, for this theorem is basically that the, the Betty numbers of the free loop space have to be unbounded. Uh, I'll come back and talk about that later. But that's, that's a condition, uh, topological condition, that will ensure that every metric has infinitely many closed geodesics. And uh, Hans Bert Rademacher has proved that uh, for most metric, on any manifold, there are also infinitely many closed geodesics. <coughs> so we do know an awful lot. And uh, in the case when the manifold is S2, we know, d due to the work of a lot of, a lot of people, even more that, that are not listed here, uh, Franks, Grayson, uh, Birkhoff, Luftendrick Schroemann, Bangert, uh, over, the, over the course of about a century, managed to prove that there are infinitely many closed geodesics for every metric on a two-sphere. So that's the two-sphere. And it, it took all of these people, and it took a whole, pretty much a whole century to do it. Uh, but for example, uh, if you take, for example, S3, it's not known whether there's a metric on S3 with just one closed geodesic. Right? All that's known is that, that the, the minimum number is at least one. There's guaranteed to be one, but not more. OK, so here, um, the method uh, that, that I've uh, used most and that I'll be using here uh, is, is Morse theory. And uh, so Morse theory is the bridge that uh, connects up the geometry, which is the geodesics and the index growth. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And the topology. So the topology is the loop space and the string products, which I'll, which I'll get to. And uh, so this is really what Morse invented Morse theory for. And uh, so here's a method. We fix, we, fix, we fix a metric on the manifold. And then the, this free loop space is an infinite dimensional manifold. It's the space of all maps from the circle into m, right? So these are just loops. And we have the energy function. It's the integral of the velocity squared. Actually, for technical reasons, it's better to use the square root of the energy function, f. It, uh, it adds like length. Length adds nicely. Uh, but uh, it also extracts a penalty for bad parameterization, so as the, as the energy does. So it has the good, good properties of both the energy and the, uh, the length, which is the square root of the energy. Um, OK, so, uh, so th what, what, what this bridge, the bridge that I just had up here, the bridge between geometry and topology does is that uh, 
gives it gives a um, correspondence between um, critical points of this energy function, which are precisely the closed eudesics on M, and uh, um, and homology of the free loop space. Right, so that's that's basically what Morse theory does. And, uh, in particular, if we want to make it more specific, um, this correspondence more or less connects k-dimensional homology on the free loop space and critical points of index k. Um, so here, and here's one way to sort of describe this correspondence. So uh, given a homology class on lambda, uh, the critical level of x is defined to be uh, the, the inf over all real numbers a such that, such that x is supported on the loops of length less than or equal to a. I'm just going to I'm going to use the word length, whether I really mean the square root of f, f the square root of e. So uh, so here's a picture. This is a, a very schematic picture of the free loop space. It's an infinite dimensional manifold, much bigger than what I've drawn here. And uh, I take a a uh, homology class. So this homology class is represented by a cycle. So here's the cycle. And what I what I do is I push it down until it gets stuck, and I can't push it down any farther. And then I, I produce here a critical level, right? And the critical points, the critical points of the energy function are exactly uh, closed geodesics on M. So uh, for each each place where it's the uh, a cycle gets stuck, we get we get a critical critical level. Um, okay, so that's one way to describe the, the correspondence for Morse theory. Um, uh, right. So, uh, and then the question is, uh, can we use somehow this correspondence to count closed geodesics on M? It, it seems very, very easy to do that, right? You have this this uh, free loop space is a huge infinite dimensional manifold. It has lots of homology, and we should therefore be able to um, find uh, lots of closed geodesics on M. And the basic difficulty with that is the problem of iterates. So every time you have a closed geodesic, you can also go around the same path twice, or the same path three times, or the same path four times. And you get different points in the free loop space, right? Because the elements of the free loop space are parameterized curves. So this is a little bit different from what multiplicity means in, uh, for minimal surfaces. So we don't have, it doesn't look like this, right? It doesn't look, it looks like this, right? It's uh, the length. The length of, if it goes around three times, the length is three times the original length. And the index is not the same as the index. The index grows by a complicated formula that I'll get to in a minute. So uh, the difficulty is, you know, we want to have a correspondence here. We want to say that uh, if we have a homology class, we get a critical point, which is a closed geodesic. But the difficulty is that uh, different iterates appear as completely different um, critical points. So if you, you can imagine that. Uh, you can imagine that the free loop space looks like this. Well, let me make it like this at least. So it's so here's the free loop space, and then if you have one honest goodness closed geodesic, it actually appears as um, actually each time it appears, it appears as two circles, because you can change the change the base point and you can also reverse the orientation. So it appears once going around once, it appears again going around twice, it appears again going around three times. And there's this infinite family just coming from one closed geodesic. So it makes it, uh, makes it difficult to count. Uh, right, so uh, I think this is basically what I, what I just said. So inside the free loop space, one closed geodesic appears like a whole army of critical points, right? Which makes it difficult to count. So, uh, but still, I mean, this is very compelling. This idea of you want to use somehow make a correspondence between k-dimensional homology, the free loop space, and critical points, which are of course closed geodesics of index k. So this leads to what it seems to be an obvious question, which is the, which is the following: uh, In order to do something with this correspondence, right? Over here, you want to you want to um, you want to identify different iterates of the same closed geodesic. So is there something over here that would have the same effect, right? So in other words, the question is, is there s an algebraic structure, for example, a product, right, on this side that would correspond to iteration on the other side? So that, that would allow us to give a count. 
And uh, it turns out that, uh, in fact, in many critical cases, the answer is yes, there is such a product. So, um, OK, so now this is, this is a little topology. I'm going to talk about products on loop spaces. So uh, I'm going to start off with the base loop space, right? So the manifold has a base point. And this is the space of all loops that start at the, at the base point. So topologists like this space. And uh, on this space, we have this is defined, I don't know, a really long time ago, the Pontryagin product on the homology of the um, base loops. And it's defined as follows. So take two cycles, right? Take two cycles, uh, representatives of homology class here. You can just think of them as subsets, right? They have th they're parameterized, but you, I think it's good to just think of A and B as subsets of the base loops. And then they, they represent homology classes. Let's say A has dimension i and B has dimension j. Then the Pontryagin product we get just by multiplying, whoops, multiplying the two together. Right, so if you have, this is a homology class, this is a homology class, the Pontryagin product, you take two representatives, right, A and B, and you take the set of all loops of the form alpha followed by beta, right, where alpha is going around at A and beta is going around B. So, uh, and this is in, and this gives you some, this is concatenation, right, one loop followed by the other loop, and it gives you an element of H i plus j because, where did the i plus j come from? Well, there's, this has dimension i and this has dimension j. So it's, it's parameterized on the product of whatever those two parameter spaces were. So that's, um, that's the first product. That's the Pontryagin product. And it's already pretty interesting. So here's an example. There's a, it's com a quiz coming, so pay attention. <laughs> All right, so here are some, here are some cycles in, in the base loop space. Uh, so, so this is m equals Sn, the circle. I'm sorry, the sphere of radius n. OK, so here's some cycles on the base loops. So this is the thing in the, in the upper right-hand corner is the dimension. There's the very simple zero-dimensional cycle, which is just the constant loop at the base point. Right? That's a zero-dimensional cycle. Here's, a, here's an n minus one-dimensional cycle. It consists of all circles beginning at the base point with a, with a given tangent vector v. So uh, I'm assuming that this is a round sphere. A circle is defined to be the intersection of a round sphere with a two-plane, not necessarily through the origin, right? So if the two-plane goes through the origin, it's a great circle. And if the two-plane doesn't go through the ar origin, it's a not-so-great circle. But the great circles are the, are the closed geodesics, right? The great circles on the sphere. So there's also, here's a, here's a cycle of dimension 2 and minus 2. It's all circles beginning at, beginning at the base point. OK, so let's see if we can compute some products. This is a zero dimensional cycle. This is, a, this is a n minus 1 dimensional cycle. What's the Pontryagin product of those? You have to take first one of these and then one of those. And what are you going to get? It's just a again, right? Right? This is just a. Does everybody agree? All right. All right. Now, what about a Pontryagin product with itself? What's the dimension of that? 2n minus 2. Maybe you can guess what the answer is, because it's also on the sh slide, right? <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually this, but it's, it's not so obvious, maybe, right? So if you take, if you ta this consists of all things where you take one of these and then follow another one of these, right? It's not so obvious, but the answer is actually what? It's B, right? It's, it's not obvious, but it is B. Uh, if you want to, you can think about it like this. If you start with A, right, uh, you can take two copies of A and uh, twist one a little bit so that, so that it starts off with a different initial vector. And then you have all these circles, and none of them is smooth, right? So all of them have some corner that could be, could be pushed in, and we can push it down to one level lower. OK, so what are the critical levels in the standard metric? The critical level is, right, we want to make it as short as possible, right? Shorten all the loops. Uh, this is 2 pi, right? Do you believe that? You can't, you, can't, you can't shrink that below the level 2 pi. Now, what's, 
What's the critical level of this? Critical level of A, Pontryagin pro product A. It's this is this is B, right? So it's also it's also two pi, but it, it's not so obvious either, right? That you can you can shorten them, right? Continuously shorten them. So this is two pi, and in fact, uh, this is two m pi. <laughs> I have the answers on the next page here. And this is also 2m pi. OK, so this is a is actually a non-nilpotent element. That means if you take any power of it, it's not equal to 0. But it's not level non-nilpotent, right? Because if you multiply it by itself, you can push it down, but you, it, doesn't, it doesn't become 0. It doesn't become trivial. Um, and in fact, uh, the, um, the homology of the Base loop space is, is a Pontryagin product, Pontryagin ring, and it's, it's just Z bracket A, right? It's a polynomial ring on this, uh, on this gener generator A. So that's the Pontryagin product. Um, there's also a coproduct. There's a coproduct on the homology of the There's a coproduct, and here's how the coproduct co, uh, co works. This was d developed by, um, well, it was described briefly by Sullivan, and, and Mark Goreski and I uh, worked on this coproduct. So we start off with a cycle in the base loop space. Uh, so it, it represents an element of k dimensional homology. And then we do the following thing first, we cross with an interval. That puts us inside here, right? Now, inside this space, we have this other space, F. F stands for figure eight space. And this is the space of all uh, things of the form a, a loop followed by a time such that uh, there's a self-intersection at time t. Right? So this is, uh, this is the, the figure eight space. So we take A cross I, and we intersect it with F, and we end up in here. right? So we, look, we, take, we, take, our, our, we take a loop in here. We, we take all the values of t, and we look around to see if we find a self-intersection. And if we find a self-intersection, um, then we cut, cut it into two pieces. OK, so this, <coughs> this gives a map. Um, so we start with a, a homology class A, represented by the guy A. <coughs> this is in the base loop space. Um, plus 1 minus n, this is by uh, multiplying by the interval, right? And then minus n um, is, is where does the minus n come from? We're looking to see whether it intersects or not, right? We're looking to see whether uh, gamma of 0 equals gamma of t, right? So this is a co-dimension n condition, right? Saying that gamma of 0 is, is gamma of n is a, is a co-dimension n condition. So, um, so we end up with um, a coproduct means that you start with, you have one input and you come out with two outputs. So it's, it's sort of the opposite of a product. A product would have two inputs and one output. So this is A, and then we get this is, this is the notation for the coproduct. It's in dimension, uh, the sum of these guys is k plus 1 minus n. And the, the way you should think about it is, is you, you start with a cycle on the base loop space. You look for all the self-intersections. And when you see a self-intersection, you cut. So, uh, so this, this, this is the idea. The idea is very simple and very beautiful, but there's some um, problems with it. Um, first of all, the definition of the coproduct is not rigorous. This business about intersecting, you need to have some kind of transversality condition to make that work. And there's also this horrible technical difficulty that <coughs> there's a boundary term, right? So you don't end up here where you would like to be, but you end up somewhere here, right? There's, a, there's this horrible thing over here. Um, which lots of people spend a lot of time. I know Sullivan struggled with this. Uh, Mark and I struggled with it. I know a, a lot of other people who I won't mention who struggle with it, but um, it's, a, it's a technical matter. OK, so now I'm going to say a little bit about products on uh, the free loop space. So here, the, the base point is allowed to be anything. And uh, this is maybe the most famous of these products, is the Chaz Sullivan product. It was inter uh, introduced in 1999. And again, there's this assumed transversality over here. But 
Given two cycles in the free loop space, just think of them as, as subsets if you want. Uh, so the, the, the Chas Solon product of these two homology classes is the homology class of the space of all loops of the form alpha composed with, uh, concatenated with beta. So alpha is in A, beta is in B, and, and you can only concatenate them if they have the same base point, right? You can't, you can't stick them together unless they have the same base point. So this, this gives us a map from I-dimensional tensor J-dimensional, and this has dimension I plus J minus N. Where does the minus N come from? It, you can only stick them together if they have the same base point, right? So uh, if you take an I-dimensional class and a J-dimensional class, it's, it's co-dimension N that they, they have the same base point. And that's, that's the dimension of the chat solon product. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, I'll mention there's also a co-product on, on, uh, on the free loops. And basically, the co-product does the two things that I did at the same time. Right? So, so it, it, does it, it, does it, uh, um, it does it in the free loop space and uh, what, you, what you see in the, uh, the base loops. And so this co-product is, is, uh, has a um, degree uh, minus n plus 1. And it has this, this bad boundary term. And again, the, the idea of this co-product is that you find all the self intersections and you cut. OK, so again, the original definition of Chaz and Sullivan was not rigorous. But, uh, and Cohen and Jones gave a rigorous uh, definition. And other definitions were given by Mark Oreski and myself, and also uh, Natalie Wall and me. And uh, we also managed to get rid of the horrible boundary term, which and it, it was surprisingly easy. OK, so here's um, some other examples. Um, this is, these are now in the free loop space, not the base loop space. Some cycles in the free loop space. So we still have this one, the constant loop at the base point, right? That's dimension 0. Here's an n-dimensional. These, these are cycles on uh, this n-dimensional sphere again. Did I say that? It should say that. Yeah, it's at the top, m equals sn. So this, this is on the n-dimensional sphere. Uh, this is an n-dimensional cycle, right? It's all the, all the point loops at all possible points on the manifold, right? That's an n-dimensional cycle in the, this is a, an n-dimensional subset, right, of the free loop space. And then we have this one that we had before, right? This came from the, the base loops. And then uh, we had this one before, too. This was also for the base loops, right? Remember those? And uh, this one uh, is the space of all circles, great and small. And if you count correctly, you get it, it's dimension 3n minus 2. Right? So this picture is supposed to, the different colors represent different um, points in this cycle. right? OK, so here's the quiz again. What is C? What's the chas solon product of C with e, with e? So what does the chas solon product do? First of all, you take one of these and one of those, and you concatenate them, but only if they have the same base point. Right? So you take one of these, and you take uh, one, of, one of these and one of those. It's still going to be a, 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 a trivial loop, right? But you only concatenate them if they have the same base point, and this is going to turn out to be what? E, right? In fact, that's, that's the uh, identity element, right? C is the identity element. I'm sorry, U, U is the identity. What is this? I'm sorry, this is, I, I thought this was something different. Um, yeah, that's wrong. C, what, what's, yes, um, I, I was computed the wrong thing. What's C tensor E? C is all circles great and small, right? And E is this guy here, right? And if we take um, the chas solon product of that, we take one of these and we concatenate it with one of those, but only if they have the base point. So what do you get back again? You get, you get C, right? right so e, e is the identity element, sorry. So this is C, yes? Let's see. <laughs> what is this? We did this before, didn't we? Is the answer still the same? We take, we take, where are they? A is up there. We take one of those and we follow it by another one. And we concatenate them, but only if they have the same base point. What, anybody know what it is? 
Remember, uh, pretend that there's transversality? This is zero. Right? In fact, if you take any two elements that come from the base loops, their, their chat Sullivan product is zero because you could, you could, you could put, put all of these at one base point and all of these at another base point, and they're never going to intersect. Right? So it's a, different, it's a different product than what you see in the, in the base loop. So this is equal, this is zero. This is zero. Um, and C, Chad Selwyn product C, is the set of all loops of the form gamma concatenated with tau, where they're both uh, circles great and small, but you, you can only concatenate them if they have the same base point. So uh, this is an example of one point in, uh, in this, this image. And in fact, this product is not e equal to 0. And uh, what I've showed you are basically you can, you can uh, find generators for the whole uh, homology ring using basically this picture. Right? So for example, if n is even, it's an, if it's an even dimensional sphere, the whole, the whole ring is generated by cycles of this type. And uh, this it was computed by uh, Cohen, Jones, and, and Yan, uh, but not by this method. They didn't have any, ex these are just, they didn't use explicit, explicit cycles. Um, and uh, I, I first heard of the Chaz Solon product. I was sitting at lunch at IAS <coughs> in 2007, and I heard somebody define the Chaz Solon product. And I got so excited, I jumped up. I said, I know that product. I said, Morse knew that product. And for, if you look in uh, Morse, Morse's book, which is very difficult to read, on um, um, uh, What's the name of the book? Um, somebody, anybody? Uh, calculus, of ca calculus of variations in the large. Yeah. If you look in that book, you, these 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 products appear, right? He doesn't he doesn't say that they're products, but he actually by hand computes the homology of the of the base loop space using using these cycles. Okay, so. Um, let me also mention, so here's, here's just a little bit of algebra, which I can't avoid. Sorry. So I'll just say it quickly. So if you have a coproduct on homology, which I just described, right? The coproduct on homology, you look for in intersections and you cut them apart. You get a product on cohomology. Okay, and and, you, and you, some statements come out nicely. Here, so. Um, so the next slide, don't, wor don't worry about the, the uh, numbers. Um, so I want to say a little bit about uh, geometry and iteration and products. So this has to do with examples of relations between products and geometry. So what, what are these, these, these string products, right? The chess cell one product, the coproduct. What does it have to do with, with geometry and closed geodesics? Well, uh, First of all, we have this, this basic inequality, which is, a, which is a, a beautiful thing. I mean, it seems to me that this, is, this alone is well worth the price of admission. I mean, if, if these products didn't do anything but this, that, that would be a wonderful thing. Um, the, the hom if you take two homology classes and take the Chaz Sullivan product, the critical level is, at most, the sum of these two critical levels. And for cohomology, everything is upside down. For If you take two cohomology, Two cohomology classes, the critical level of theirs is greater than or equal to the sum of these two. Now, um, it's very important that these are different signs. So what's going on here is not algebraically dual to what's going on there. It's, 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 it's uh, related in some, uh, some beautiful way, but it's not, uh, it's not the geometry is, is, is uh, it's not just algebraically dual. So, uh, and here are some old theorems restated. Just to show you um, what you can do with these products. So uh, Bot did not write down this theorem in these words, but uh, uh, <coughs> this is a restatement, right? So suppose all closed eudesics on M are non-degenerate. Then uh, the critical level of x to the M eventually <coughs> falls off from M times the value, right? So uh, every element is eventually um, um, level nilpotent, right, in, if it's non-degenerate. 
right? The, the examples that I showed you on the, on the standard metric, they are level. Some of them are C, for example, is non level non -no potent. Okay, so this is, so here's here's and this is this is a theorem of mine. Uh, two two versions of this. Uh, so this one says uh, if you have a homology class and if the critical level holds at m times the original level for all m, then m has infinitely many closed geodesics. Of course, this can't com this can't happen in the non-degenerate case, right? This could only happen in a degenerate case. But this is a degenerate case that comes up in a lot of examples. And then there's another theorem, right? So this one is the upside down of that one. And this says if you have a cohomology class, right, and if it is level non nil potent, right? If, it's, if the critical level is always this high for all m, then m has infinitely many closed geodesics. So, uh, so what, what is this supposed to tell you about? It's supposed to tell you the relationship between the products, right? Relationship between the products and closed geodesics. Uh, okay, so here's one more slide on that. So index growth. There's a very, very famous theorem of Bott in 1956, which is sort of the, you know, the, the main technique that was used in, in this subject for many, many years. It's the formula for the index of the iterates, right? So again, um, if you, have a, if you have a geodesic that goes around m times, right, then the index is given by, this is by a complicated formula. And uh, what Bott proved that it grows approximately linearly. And um, so uh, the index of, if you take a, a closed geodesic gamma and uh, you go around m times, the index of that, this is a Morse index, right? The Morse index. It's, it's bounded below by, by m times index minus this number and it bounded above by m times the same index and this, this same. Right, right, so these are the same, plus or minus this. And uh, the relationship with products is the following. If there's a quality, right? So if either this is equal or if this is equal, then they're guaranteed to be non-trivial loop products. So the loop products are, are, are um, very closely related to index growth. And in fact, if there's minimal growth, right? So minimal growth would be in equality here. Uh, then there are non-trivial chat Sullivan products. And if there's maximal growth, that would mean that we have equality here. Then uh, we have non-trivial uh, gorsky hingston product. So, um, and, and here's another example, right? For the spheres and projective spaces, this is with, with a standard metric, it should say. All geodesics are closed, right? Everybody knows that, right? And in the case when all geodesics are closed, you have both minimal and maximal growth at the same time because you have minimal growth for the index and no, minimal growth for the index plus nullity and maximal growth for the index, right? So they're both appear, they're both there at the same time, and uh, the, so the products are very highly non-trivial in these cases. All right. So. Um, OK, so I want to talk about a little bit of topology now. So uh, this is a recent work on loop products, which are also called uh, string topology, AKA string topology. So this is with Natalie Wall. And uh, so uh, first of all, remember that I, I had that boundary term? This is saying that uh, this lift uh, gets rid of the boundary term in the coproduct. Uh, so it, this, this is the uh, way of getting rid of that, that boundary term. And it satisfies, I, I didn't write down the properties, but they're properties that, that you, would, uh, you would be willing to agree, <laughs> agree with. Uh, the natural, natural things that it should satisfy. And the lift is it's associative, it's sign commutative, and it satisfies the basic Morse theoretic inequality. So this is just saying that you can get rid of the boundary term and, and nothing bad happens. Um, so it still has the same properties as before. Um, <coughs> and, and we also now have a new geometric property, which is the following. So if you take uh, if you take a chain in the free loop space, you can, again, you can just think of it as being a, a subset of the free loop space. 
And suppose that it's supported on the simple loops, right? So it doesn't have loops without any self-intersections. Then the coproduct of A is equal to 0. OK, now this, this should be true. I was looking for this for a really long time. Natalie and I and, and Ralph Cohen were working on this. And how could it not be true? I mean, the whole idea of the, of the coproduct is you, 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 take, you take your cycle, right? You look, and wherever you see a, a, um, a self-intersection, you, you cut it, right? And you save it. But you don't save, you don't save it if it doesn't have any self-intersections. So I mean, if, if our idea of, of what this coproduct is has anything to do with what it actually is, this should be true. But, but for many, many years, it, it just wasn't available. It wasn't a proof. And uh, so the proof, is, the proof is available now. And it uses uh, the new definitions, right? So we have new definitions for the, um, for the coproduct. And it also uses the lift, right? So the, the way that we have of getting rid of the boundary term. OK, so, um, so here's the intuition. The intuition is that, uh, again, the coproduct what the coproduct does is it looks at loops, right? Every time it sees a self-intersection, it cuts and it keeps the two pieces. Right? So, um, so uh, it should it should certainly be that if there's no self-intersections, then the then the uh, um, coproduct is equal to zero. Now, um, in fact, it, it's even better than that. So, for example, do you remember that? Uh, that cycle C, right, that consisted of all circles, great and small, right? All the circles were simple, but it had the, those pesky um, constant loops in there, too, right? So uh, this, the coproduct doesn't even see that, right? It doesn't, um, uh, it's still true, right, that the coproduct evaluated on that class is equal to 0, because um, as, as long as as long as it's 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 represented, it has a representative where everything is either um, a simple loop or a constant loop. You're still going to get zero. So trivial loops are allowed. Right? And so I mean the way that I think of that is that so the coproduct is is really smart, right? And it, it in fact it's so smart it's not even foolish enough to mistake this tautology, right? So gamma of 0 equals gamma of 0, which is what you get when you set gamma of 0 equal to gamma of s and then let s go to 0. That's not really a self-intersection, right? There's no, there's no loop there, right? So, um, so it doesn't, um, it's not foolish enough to mistake that for an actual self-intersection at the base point. OK, so here's. Um, OK, so, um, so even better, we have the following thing. So, uh, so here's a definition. We say the loop has a k-fold intersection at some point if uh, the inverse image of p consists of exactly k points. So this is an example of a simple loop, right? It has one-fold intersections, right? This, is a, this one has two two-fold intersections, right? This one has one three-fold intersection. And uh, so here's the theorem. If we take a cycle in the, in the free loop space, uh, and if every non-constant loop in the image, every non-constant, right? Every non-constant loop in the image of Z has at most k-fold intersections, then uh, the k-fold um, coproduct of Z is equal to 0. So the k-fold coproduct is the following thing. We take, we take the cycle, right? And we go around, and every time we see a self-intersection we cut right and keep them right and then we and you get a bunch you get a bunch of um, cut apart um, loop um, cycles right and then for each of those you do the same thing again you so you just you just do the same um, same operation again right so we start off with we start off with a cycle right and then every time you see a self-intersection you cut and you save both sides right you do that for the whole cycle then you do it for everything that's left, and you, and you keep doing it. And then the, the upshot is that this is equal to 0 if every non-constant loop had at most k-fold intersections. And it turns out that this is sharp for spheres and projective spaces. So in other words, if uh, on a sphere or projective space, um, 
if this is equal to 0, then there is a representative with, at most, k-fold intersections. So, um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's um, very nice property. OK, so um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was uh, some formulas involving the product and the coproduct. So this is something that Sullivan was asking me about. He kept asking me about, is there any formula that involves the both the product and the coproduct at the same time? And uh, so there are some. Uh, well, first of all, if you take, if you do first the coproduct and then the product, right? So you start with one input, you you take the coproduct and then you and then you take the Chad Sullivan product of those together. That's equal to zero. Mod the mod the constant loops. This I wrote it this way too because this is such a nice way of writing it, right? Right. This is equal to zero, right? This is this is this is first we take the coproduct and then we do the Chad Sullivan product, right? Anyway, this is a nice way of writing it. Uh, so well, I write however, right? The only reason I write this however is because um, one thing you always have to worry about products, they could be trivial, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they could be always zero, and that's not really so interesting. So, so if, if I'm going to tell you when something's zero, I should also tell you something that's not zero, right? So this is something that's not zero. Uh, if you take m equals m3 and k greater than or equal to 14 even, I don't know, blah, 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 blah then uh, there's something that, that if you t that's not equal to 0, right? So it's similar to that, but first you do the coproduct, and then you do a Dane twist on each of these circles, and then you, and then you, do, you, then you do the coproduct, then you do the product on that, right? And this is, this is non-trivial, so. Uh, OK, so um, what about the other way around? So the one I just did was first. First coproduct and then product, so this is going the other way around. So what happens if we first do the Chas Solon product and then we do the coproduct? So that gives this picture, if you believe pictures like this, which maybe you shouldn't. Um, so if this were field theory, then there's this Fubinius formula, right, which says that these should be the same, right, right, right. And uh, what is this one? This one is. This one is uh, uh, one of these is this, and one of these is that. I guess it depends on which loop is loop, which is. Uh, so this would be a nice property, but this this seems to be true only for trivial coproducts. So this is this this is not this is not the right formula, right? Um, Sullivan had a formula that he was pushing, which is the following thing. Um, uh, if we take the coproduct of the Chas Sullivan product, so Chas Sullivan first and then coproduct, we get two terms, right? Now, what it says is the following that formula. It says if you want to find the self intersections of A Chas Sullivan product with B, remember what Chas, A Chas Sullivan product with B looked like? It's, it's, it's uh, two loops stuck together, one from, one from A and one from B, right, w with the same base point. So the self-intersections of A followed by B, right, is what is this? This is all the self-intersections of A with a B stuck on, and this is the self-intersection of B with A stuck on in the front, right? So basically what that formula is saying is that uh, the self-intersections of the chas solon product come from the self-intersections of A and the self-intersections of B. Um, so, and this is, it, has an, it would be nice for, in terms of algebra if this worked, but at least it turns out to be false, at least for our lift. Um, so, um, and uh, you know, we, there are examples that we can compute, for, like for example, for the three sphere that show that the left hand side is not equal to the right hand side here. Um, so, um, uh, so work in progress. Uh, this is work that was motivated by work I did, I don't know, a long time ago in the finite dimensional approximation. Uh, this is Morse's finite dimensional approximation for the um, loop space. Uh, so th I, th I think this is true. So if you take the left-hand side minus the right-hand side, so the failure of, the, of, the ch of, the, uh, of Sullivan's formula up there picks up what I would call self, self or se second order self-intersections of A and B. Uh, I'm sorry, s second order 
intersections, right? So in other words, uh, in order to do the Chas Selman product, right, you have to, um, we want like A and B to in intersect transversely, right? And whenever they intersect, we concatenate them and, and put it into this, this Chas Selman product. So, <clears throat> so it, it picks up second order intersections of A and B, of the base points of A and B. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, 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 it's somewhat mysterious and not yet uh, proved. But um, so, here is, um, so here's what I think is true. So, if, so first of all, this is a definition, OK? So alpha and beta are loops, right? If alpha and beta are loops, then they have a first order, first order, or transverse, right? First order, transverse is a different word for first order. Base point intersection if the following is true. So first of all, they have to have the same base point, right? And second, of, second the, t the derivatives, the velocity vector, has to uh, exist at both points. And it has to span a two-dimensional subspace of the tangent space. So uh, the loops that we're talking about here are H1 loops. And uh, so the, the derivative exists almost everywhere. So, but this is, this is what I mean by having a first order intersection. Um, so the, the, two, the two velocity vectors should exist, and they should, they should, they should cross right in a nice way. And uh, so, so what, what, what I, th I think is true is that if, um, if we take um, two homology classes, and if they have representatives with only first order base point intersections, then that formula, the Sullivan's formula, is true. Um, so, uh, maybe I'll just stop there. Thank you.